Welcome back. I am Marcella Costa from Flinders University and, and I've been giving some talks on the subject from art to science in search of reality, the role of painting in the history of humankind. And I started in the first part from Kai painting to the Roman realism. And in the second part, from the decadence of Roman realism during Christianity, all the way back to Renaissance. In this talk today, I'm going to talk about the geometry of space, how space became pictorial with the Renaissance, and the painting became linear geometry with the Renaissance, and therefore visual representation became geometry, and thus quantitative, with a consequence indeed for science. So today I'm going to cover in the part three the a period or the concept that goes between geometry to the birth of physics. Summarizing, in the Renaissance with the geometrical depiction of space, the human personal point of view is shared with others, becoming objective. Humanism slowly replaced religion. Human being became central in the art of the Renaissance and realistic depiction of the world marked the birth of natural sciences. This naturalistic movement secularized life and prepared the scientific revolution. Well, indeed, this process of geometrization of science started with the Renaissance geometric approaches which extended from perspective to architecture, to commerce, and to all natural sciences, including human and animal sciences. We've seen an example of architecture, of course, rich perfection in the Renaissance with straight lines, which allowed indeed the, the geometry of perspective to be developed. But commerce also started at the time in the middle of the Renaissance, in this book, The Aritmetica, Filippo Calandri, a classic Florentine and woodcut book, uh, produced this book primarily as an inexpensive textbook for instructing youth in the rudiments of mercantile math. It was the first illustrated book of mathematics written in Italian rather than Latin. Covered the mercantile world of weights, measures, exchange rates, the dimension of barrels, the construction of sacks, the tiling of floor, masons building walls, the capacity of a strong box, etc. You can see a kind of geometry with relations between numbers forming the, the principle of uh, ratios. We come to, of course, to Leonardo da Vinci that changed a human body into a geometry in a way, the famous Vitruvian Man in 1490, just two days, two years before the discovery or rediscovery of, of the Americas by Christophorus Columbus. Of course, Leonardo da Vinci published an enormous range of draft and drawings of the human body uh, with uh, enormous detail, which paralleled the enormous detail of the real representation of the external world. He painted faces, but painted also the, the view of how the brain was organized and how to depict really the complexity of the brain that will remain complex up to date. Of course, later in the 1500s, Andreas Vesalius published an enormous amount of information about the human body, and we owe to him still a lot of modern anatomy. An almost detail, which eventually became, already with Leonardo da Vinci, details that not only were painted, but were actually based on real measurements, in this case, of animals. So, the geometry of animals, or humans, was the foundation of modern science. Even going back to the 1474, Piero La Francesca, in his book De Prospettiva Pingendi, he began to measure the actual sizes of human heads and how they would appear on the painting to apply indeed the, the linear geometry of perspective. But measuring, therefore, was part of art. Leon Battista Alberti, still in the 15th century, in this uh, Divina Proporzione, on the divine proportion, 
It's a book of mathematics written by Luca Pacciola, illustrated by Leonardo da Vinci, completed in 1498 in Milano. Its subject was mathematical proportions. The title refers to the golden ratio and the application to geometry, the visual art through perspective and to architecture. So you can see that geometry became increasingly important. Of course, with Albrecht Dürer in the 1500, he continued to measure the size of, uh, in this, a baby and adult bodies, a woman, and this represented really the birth of modern science. Albert Dürer uh, even imagined that you can transform the, the round shape of human body into geometrical bodies uh, using simple geometry of space. Ener Schorn uh, attempted really to simplify the complexity of the shape of human being, again, by giving geometrical proportions by simple bodies that were, not, were well known to the geometry of space. Of course, geometry applied also to the idea of vision, how people see the eyes. Even Leonardo da Vinci saw the eye as a potential as a camera obscura, a point where the light got in through a little hole and projected on the back of the eye where the retina is. The geometry of optics was closely related to the issue of light, vision and application to dark room, and some dials, the gnomonics. You can see here the earliest known image of the camera obscura from German Frisius, the Russia Astronomica and Geometrica in 1545 to visualize a solar eclipse in 1544. You can see here the little hole, the camera oscura, which really reflects something that is seen from a side. Descartes, of course, was well aware uh, of the optic of the eye and proposed by Schneider. And uh, when he wrote the Dioptric, he used these drawings to understand how the, the eye works with the lens here and the projection of what is aside onto the back of the eye. At the time, he knew nothing about the retina, of course. <coughs> there is a good relation between geometrical perspective and the optic of vision. According to the perspective, perspicture, you can see here the shape of a triangle projected onto a window, and how the eyes actually see. Here, the eyes is actually put in, in the first person with a similarity between the dark room and the human eye. This was about 1646 in Paris by Jean-Francois Nisseron. Geometry was then extended to the very issues about the Earth and the entire cosmos. Maps were already been made in the uh, ancient uh, Greece in the Renaissance of the Greek period, 150 before Jesus Christ, you can see a fairly accurate description of the Mediterranean with uh, Greece, Italy, Spain, North Africa. Here is the Nile, Egypt. So you can see quite detailed the, 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 the various inner lakes and the Caspian Sea. Quite remarkable detail, except that was, was outside was really not clear, not known. And they call already Mare Astralis, means on the south, some people didn't know exactly what it was there, but it was quite advanced for the time. But just like the rest of the painting, the geometry of the world, of the world, the maps, uh, were lost during the decadence of the Roman Empire and the growth of Christianity. This Mappa Mundi in 1776 of the current era of San Beatus of Lie Ebana, he was a monk geographer in the Iberian kingdom of the Asturias, and this was really based on the account given by Isidoro Seville, Ptolemy and the Holy Bible. You can see here the Mediterranean, you can see here Egypt with the River Nile, probably this may represent Italy, this may represent Greece, but you can see how simplistic and fundamentally incomplete these maps were in the very middle of Christianity. There was a recovery at the time of the Istanbul, the map of Istanbul was still fairly primordial, but already in 1154, you can see there was actually a tabula rogeriana, 
I put it upside down to how it was originally. But you can see here the Mediterranean again, and here the, the, the Bosphorus, and you can see probably uh, Greece and the uh, River Nile with Egypt, and you can probably see uh, Sicily, Italy, and Spain, and France, and North Africa. So this was a slow recovery of the ability to draw in two dimensions a map of the world, of at least the area where the civilization grew up. Already in the 1580, in the very middle uh, advanced Renaissance, geography was very advanced. This is in the Vatican Museum, a map of Italy, you can see all the details which are still significantly similar to what we know today. Going to cosmology, the geocentric universe of Aristotle and Ptolemy, with the orbit of moon, sun and the five planets, circle the Earth. This actually is the Silum Imperium Habitaculum Dei and Omnium Electorum. Heavily empowered, well of God and all the selected. This was the Ptolemaic conception, was still available or, or common in the very Renaissance period. Again, here you can see the Earth at the center of the universe with the Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun goes around, Saturn, and then the, the heavens, immutable past the, 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 our universe. Well, this was given a big shock <coughs> by applying. Indeed, again, in a very enlightened way, the simple linear geometry of Euclidus that was developed in 300 before Christ. This was pictures taken from, indeed, the, the, the uh, Euclidus books. And this was applied by the famous Nicolaus Copernicus that in 1543 published a book the Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium, of the revolutions of the celestial bodies. He applied, again, simple geometry from Euclid's, core geometry by, by taking little changes, but fundamentally did not change the very geometry that was used in the, by, the, by the Greeks. He printed in 1543 in Nuremberg this book, this, uh, the revolution was Arabium Celestium. In the, as a second edition, this is a picture of that. In 1549, Melanchthon Luther, principal lieutenant, wrote against Copernicus, pointing to the theory of apparent conflict with the scripture, the Bible, and advocating that severe measures be taken to restrain the impiety of Copernicans. Because he presented a very different idea with the Sun at the center of the universe, and then Mercury, Venus, the Earth, then Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then the fixed stars further away. So this was a big, big revolution in thinking that appeared to be against the teaching of the Bible. Who made the next important step was Galileo Galilei, who developed eventually his Carocchiale, the first telescope, through which in the early 1600s he could see very well the moon and its phases, and he drew very well. You notice, he was a scientist, a mathematician, a physicist, but he was also a good painter. He drew very well what he saw. And he published, indeed, uh, the Historia and a Dimostrazioni Intorno le Macchie Solari e Loro Accidenti, around the history and demonstration of the solar spots and the accident, and he analyzed the perspective of the sunspot. He could draw the sunspot, seeing that they change as they rotate, the, and he realized that the, the, the sun does rotate, or the earth rotates around the sun, and he could project by using good linear perspective where they would appear on a picture, flat picture, uh, depending on the fact they were actually on a sphere. So he was fully aware of applying good geometrical perspective. In all his work, in fact, he also applied in this uh, very famous book about the foundation of physics, 
it allows in fundamentally still the very traditional Euclidean geometry. You see the power of the geometry applied now to the birth of uh, science. So, painting became linear geometry with Renaissance, we saw that. Painting became geometry and thus quantitative. Space became geometry with Galileo Galilei. So, coming from painting, art, to the very beginning of science. Later, in the 1600s, after Galileo, Descartes described the method now called analytical geometry to solve geometrical problems with the help of algebra. He merged indeed geometry and algebra. Analytical geometry is a bridge between algebra and geometry and provides bridges between shape and quantity, number and form, the analytical and the synthetic, the discrete and the continuous, the two aspects of our way of looking in a quantitative way the universe. Analytical geometry produced a most important coupling of algebra and geometry, a relationship that proved very fruitful for subsequent development in mathematics. So, in summary, we can say that uh, space became pictorial with the Renaissance, painting became linear geometry again with the Renaissance, space became geometry with Galileo Galilei, and geometry of space became mathematics with Descartes. The World, a book by Descartes, had become ready for publication in 1633. The world system he had adopt, adopted in the book assumed, as did Galileo, the heliocentric Copernican model, the sun of the center universe and no longer the earth. Upon hearing of the church condemnation of Galileo in the same year, Descartes decided against its publication. In a letter to his friend Mersenne, in November 1633, Descartes expresses his fear that were he to publish the world, he would suffer the same fate of Galileo. Even worse, he was aware already that early in the 1600s, Giordano Bruno was burned alive in Rome in Campo de Fiore, that his statue, for having stated that the space is infinite, that go, did go against very much the view of the Church. So René Descartes developed a mechanistic idea of how to study animals and human body and found really physiology. In his discourse on method and meditations in 1656, he formalized the so-called Cartesian dualism with a separation between the physical things, called rest extensor, and the thinking stuff, the rest cogitans. His distinction also prevented receiving criticism by the Church about the dogma of separation between body and soul. <coughs> and we come to Isaac Newton, where he moved from geometry of space to geometry of space adding time, dynamics. He published Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica, the mathematical principle of natural philosophy, in uh, London and Cambridge over a number of years in 1600, and the optics again in the early 1700s. In these two books, he uses Euclidean geometry as a main method to prove the enormous number of lemmas, propositions, theorems, corollaries, etc., all written with enormous detail, but always using just the geometry of Euclid. And he developed what we know about the laws of motion. The first law states that a body at rest will remain at rest unless an assigned force acts on it, and a body in motion at a constant velocity will remain in motion in a straight line unless acted upon by an assigned force. This law was already implied by Galileo Galilei, by the way. The second law states that if an unbalanced force acts on a body, that body will experience acceleration or deceleration, that is, a change in speed. The third law states that for every action force in nature there is an equal and opposite direction, reaction. This is book in, in the 1700s, still using, you see, very simple geometry from uh, the 
ancient Greeks. So this is an end of my part three, moving from geometry to physics, summarizing that space became pictorial in the Renaissance, painting became linear geometry with the Renaissance, painting became geometry and thus quantitative, space became geometry with Galileo Galilei, geometric space became mathematics with Descartes, and geometry became dynamics with Newton. So you can see now a direct line between the paintings and the development of modern physics. I'll cheer up until my next part.